You've been praying for a miracle, a breakthrough. Your loved one is sick. Your finances are in shambles. Your marriage is crumbling. As the clock is ticking, you're getting more desperate. You're praying for God to send you help now, not tomorrow, but now. But heaven seems silent. You feel like giving up. It seems like it's all over for you. It's in these difficult moments, the Bible gives us the most unexpected instructions. Give thanks in advance. As you wait, give thanks. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible tells us to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for you is that in this time of uncertainty and even doubt, where you may feel like you won't make it through, that you will give thanks to Him. We need to give thanks when it doesn't look like anything is changing. You might ask, even though my child is still sick? And the answer is yes. By faith, give thanks for the healing that is coming. Even though I don't have food on my table, yes, give thanks for the Lord shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Even when I've been praying to have a child for years and the doctors are not hopeful for me, Yes, give thanks for the fruit of your womb. What is impossible with men is possible with God. God's way is that you trust Him, believe that He will answer you. He expects us to give thanks in advance. It calls for trusting God's word and trusting that He is faithful no matter what. God wants us in faith to give thanks and trust that He will not fail. In Philippians 4:6. His word says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In other words, stop wasting your time and energy worrying about that problem. Spend your energy building your faith in God. Don't waste your time complaining about your troubles. The Israelites murmured and complained when they were in the wilderness. The Lord had brought them out from captivity in Egypt, but they felt that God had brought them from a bad situation to an even worse situation. They wanted the comfort of Egypt. They wasted their time complaining because they could not see the promised land, and that's how they missed their promise. In Numbers 14, 20 through 23, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Remember that just like some of the Israelites, you could easily miss the answer to your prayer because of complaining, because of doubt. But when you thank God before you see your prayer answered, it shows God trust in Him, just like Joshua and Caleb. It shows that you know that He's listening and He will make a way where there seems to be no way. It shows that you believe that there's nothing too hard for God and that He will give you victory. You see, giving thanks is your way of saying, God, I believe that you have heard me. God, I believe that you have answered me. A story is told of a centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant who was far away from where Jesus was. Jesus offered to go to where his servant was and heal him. But the centurion was a man of faith. He understood that Jesus had authority over his situation. He understood that Jesus was powerful and was able to heal his servant just by saying a word. In Matthew 8, 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Because he believed, he told Jesus that he didn't need to go where his servant was. The centurion understood that God's word is an authority, and when he speaks, his authority is final. He knew that his servant was healed. Will it be easy to say thank you when your situation is so difficult? Maybe not, but say thank you anyway. Will you want to cry out to God until you see your miracle? Yes, 
And there's nothing wrong with that because God is your father. But God is saying to you that as you cry to him, remember to give him thanks. As you wait on him in prayer about a situation, give thanks. Our nature may be to panic. Human beings tend to worry, to be anxious about things that we're not able to control. So you have to speak to yourself. When your thoughts start drifting towards worry, you have to say, nope, I am not going to worry today. And what should you do instead? With thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's what the Word of God says. Thank Him. Cast your burdens to Him. Thank Him because you even know what He will or will not do for you. Give thanks in advance. And in a miraculous way, something begins to change inside of you. When you start to thank Him for that job or that child or that house, the dark cloud hanging over your head starts to lift. As you give thanks in advance, your faith starts to get stronger. You start to hope again. You start to see God in a different light because thanking Him in advance requires you to believe that He is and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Thanking Him in advance will require you to believe that He is faithful. And you know what? God cannot fail you. It's not His nature. He cannot deny Himself. He is faithful through the ages. 2 Timothy 2.13 tells us that if we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. He's not a man that He should lie, nor a son of man that He should change His mind. You can thank Him in advance because as sure as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, He will answer your prayers. He won't give you a stone when you ask for bread, and He won't give you a snake when you ask for a fish. So go ahead and thank Him now before you see your answered prayer. Does it mean your answer will come instantly? Is it a way to arm twist God to give you what you want? Certainly not. In fact, many times God's timing is not our timing. He does His work on a different clock. You may have to wait a while, just like Abraham and Sarah waited for their son Isaac. They waited 25 years from the time God promised a son to Abraham to the time when Isaac was born. In this age of automation, convenience, fast food, instant this and instant that, waiting can be the most difficult thing. You want to see results immediately. You may feel like God is taking too long, like He's not fully aware that you're running out of time. But you need to know that God is not running late on His appointment with you. He's never late. He can't be late because He's perfect in all His ways. In Isaiah 46.10, His Word says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. His purpose for your life will come to pass, no matter how impossible it seems to you right now. His timing is perfect. See, God has the full picture. While we can only see this moment we're in, He is carefully putting the pieces of the puzzle in your life together. He knows the best time to bring that miracle to pass. He can see how and when it will fit perfectly in your life. Keep an attitude of gratitude and wait. Trust in His timing. He knows exactly what He's doing and hasn't forgotten about you. Mary and Martha called on Jesus when their brother Lazarus was sick. They waited for Jesus, who was not too far away from where they were. They watched their brother get more and more sick until Lazarus eventually died, and it looked like it was over for them. They thought Jesus was too late and they wrapped up their brother's body as was custom and put Lazarus in a tomb. A lot might have been going on in their minds. Why Jesus? Where were you when we called? Are we not important to you? All the while, Jesus was not far away. He was only a few miles from where Lazarus was, but he was waiting for the appointed time to heal Lazarus that God may be glorified. Jesus hadn't forgotten Martha and Mary's request. He wasn't sitting somewhere trying to make his schedule work so he could come see Lazarus. 
Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. For us, when the situation looks impossible, we think it's also impossible for God. And like Mary, we're saying to the Lord, Lord, if you would have been there, my brother wouldn't have died. Lord, if you would have been there, I wouldn't have lost my marriage or that job or that child. And just like Jesus was deeply moved by Mary's sorrow, he is deeply moved by your sorrow. He knows you've been praying and waiting. He knows you may be weary and almost giving up. In John 11:39, having given up, Martha had many reasons, excuses why the tomb should not be open, and they were valid reasons. The man had been dead four days. The tomb was going to have a foul smell. Jesus said to Mary, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And God is saying to you today that if you believe, if you keep thanking him, if you wait for his perfect timing, you will see his glory through your situation. He can make your dead situation live again. He will heal, he will restore, he will deliver. God is for you and not against you. He's fighting your battles. He's fighting for you. Sometimes it takes a while to see our prayers answered because there's a battle that has to be won in the heavens. Daniel, a faithful servant of God, had to wait for his answer. He prayed, but the Bible says his angel was delayed by a battle. The Bible records that the prince of the kingdom of Persia had detained the angel for 21 days. As Daniel kept praying, as he kept waiting, Satan tried to stop Daniel's answer from getting to him, but God sent angel Michael to fight the demons. And the end of it all, God won the battle for Daniel. You may have to wait because there is a battle in the heavens, but fear not. God will win the battle for you too. Keep praying, stay on your knees, wait on him until something happens. Thanking him always in advance, waiting, for God's perfect timing. Peace can be described as an absence of war or conflict, a state of tranquility or freedom from disturbance. But is that really all that peace is to us as Christians? Peace to us means the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ it is a total engulfment of the Spirit of God such that regardless of what is presently happening, one can be at rest and not be troubled. Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace. Therefore, He alone can give peace. Peace is given. In reality, it is impossible to have total freedom from disturbance or conflict. Even when there are no external conflicts or battles, we sometimes experience internal conflicts and battles of the mind. In such a situation, peace is not only having a positive state of mind or being at rest even in the midst of battles and insurgencies, but also knowing and realizing that God is with you and Jesus is in the midst of the storm. Have you ever wondered why when some people are going through some unpleasant circumstances, trials or tribulations, they still look radiant and bright? They smile widely and deeply from their hearts as though nothing is happening and everything is fine. It is not as though they are not concerned. However, there is a kind of peace that they have deep in their hearts that makes them calm and unshaken even in the midst of these unpleasant circumstances and happenings. As I said at the beginning, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace and anyone who has come to know Him will be able to experience and find peace at all times when they need it. We can see when He demonstrated it in Mark chapter 4 verse 37 to 39. According to the scripture, there was a great storm and the disciples were very frightened. However, Jesus was sleeping peacefully. He was asleep despite the storm and not because there was no storm, but he had peace deep within him. The disciples, however, did not experience his peace until they called him into the storm and declared, Peace, be still. 
Until we invite Jesus to step into our situation, we will not experience His peace. Thank God He has promised us His peace because He knows that we live in a world full of so many troubles. The news you read from the internet every day or watch on television or listen to on the radio is enough to get you worried and bothered. God has not told us that we will not have troubles or worries. What He assured us is to be of good cheer because He has overcome the world. Glory to God! Living in this reality will make us understand, and not only that, but internalize that Christ has obtained the victory for us. Resultantly, no matter what we are going through, we are victors and not victims. We are not just conquerors, but we are more than conquerors. And this should give us a strong assurance that no matter what happens and no matter what we are going through, God is with us at all times. We live in a world where there are so many things to worry about. Most times, it seems like our problems don't actually come to an end. Instead, it keeps multiplying. However, God has assured us of His peace in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with a thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It is when we stop being worried and replace our worries with prayers, thanksgiving, and supplication that we will truly experience the peace of God that surpasses all of human understanding. The peace of God truly surpasses all human understanding. In fact, it does not make sense to the carnally minded. To them, it is simply foolishness and insensitivity. Why should you give thanks and pray when you are going through a difficult situation when you can simply be crying and wallowing in self-pity? But that is what the Bible commands us to do. The natural mind cannot really understand the concept of peace. It is only the one who is deeply rooted in Christ who believes that he is the prince of peace and the only one who can give us peace that can experience peace in the midst of perilous storms. Truly, worries, pains, troubles, trials, tribulations are things that are inevitable in our world. Every day we hear news and rumors of war, earthquakes, insurgencies, pandemics, and deaths everywhere. These things are indeed enough to make one troubled, worried, and even afraid. But we have to be intentional about finding our rest in God. It is only in Him that we can find absolute rest and peace for our souls. When we shift our attention from God, the anchor for our souls, and start focusing on the troubles and madness happening all around us, we will start being worried and we will be swallowed up by the storm. Like Peter, who started sinking immediately, he shifted his focus from Jesus to the waves around him. If we become troubled by the circumstances around us, we will start losing our peace and this will eventually cause more damage to what is already happening. In order for us to experience peace, we need to simply shift our focus from the situation that is getting us troubled and center our gaze on Jesus Christ. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, the Bible tells us to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Our faith has to be solely built and founded on Christ, our foundation. If we have that understanding, we would not be bothered whenever unpleasant circumstances are happening around us. A popular song goes thus, I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor, to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. When we put our total trust in Jesus Christ and we have faith in Him completely, it will be easy for us to take our minds off the happenings around us and experience the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding in our lives. There are times that we might be going through a period of lack or insufficiency or we might even be affected by negative changes in the economy. Perhaps it may be just a thought about the future that gets you worried about what your tomorrow will be like. It is human to think about these things, but the Bible has made us realize the futility of worrying. 
Worrying will amount to nothing but high blood pressure and hypertension. Worrying cannot add anything positive to you, but rather it will even affect you negatively. Some sickness like shock, hypertension, high blood pressure and the likes are born out of worrying. Worrying really takes a huge toll on our physical health and well-being. No wonder Jesus instructed us not to take thought about what we would eat or drink. He instructed us not to give a thought about tomorrow. Sincerely, it is not really easy to have the kind of mindset when there are tons of things to worry about, but when we look at the bad things that worrying leads to, it is better to remain still and see how God will take perfect control of the situation. Let us take a look at the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. He lived a life that if it was lived by any other human being, such a person would have been worried to death. He already knew his fate right from the time that he was going to die for the sins of the people and these same people were the ones who would always find fault in him, saying all manner of evil against him. These were enough to get him worried and depressed but he didn't mind. He continued to do his father's business despite the opposition from all corners, even when his death was near. He only hinted to the disciples that they didn't even have a clue of what was going to happen because it wasn't even obvious to them that he was concerned about taking up the cross. Yes, Jesus was concerned at a point and it is normal for that to happen to any human. But he didn't sit in it. What did he do at that point? He sought peace from God in prayers. He told God, if thou will, let this cup pass over me. Nevertheless, let your will be done. He knew what he had to go through and that he needed strength to carry on. Rather than dwelling on that and being worried, he went to God in prayers. Jesus is the perfect example. Whenever we are going through situations that look like they will consume us, we should find strength in God in the place of prayers, supplication, and thanksgiving. We should always be of good cheer, rejoicing and praising God for His deliverance. Can you remember what happened to the spies who showed unbelief and doubt in God's ability to take the promised land for their sake? They could not enter the promised land. Instead of believing and resting in God's utmost power, instead of being at peace, they kept on complaining and made most people afraid and doubt God's ability. This costed them 40 years delay. Most of them died in the wilderness. They allowed their worries, doubts, disbelief to take the best part of them. Instead of worries, give God worship. Instead of murmurings, pray. Believe in His ability to help you. Rest in the power of supplications. Rest in the power of God. When you feel any tiny bit of worry, take it to God. Surround yourself with the people of faith, those who will strengthen you in faith instead of making you imagine the worst case scenario. Those who will sing and worship with you. Those who will dance with you even in the midst of the storm. You cannot add a strand of hair to your head by worrying, so why worry? Worrying will not change your situation, but prayer and thanksgiving will not only give you peace, but also give you victory. Be of good cheer, be merry, and believe that the Spirit of God is in control. Remember God's promise to David in Psalm 91. For he will keep his angels charge over thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion adder. The young lion and dragon shalt thou trample under feet. God's angels have been kept in charge of you. He has always promised that you will tread upon whatever it is that might be be trying to harm you. So do not worry. Invite God's peace into your heart and mind.
We get afraid. We will feel fear. It started when we were little. We were afraid of noises. You feared falling, but you sat up and then you crawled. You reached up. You started getting up. You started walking. And you walked. You were not totally sure that you could walk, but something inside you knew that you couldn't keep crawling. Something inside you knew you had to walk. You are grown now. A lot of things have changed, but some things didn't. The principle of how faith overcomes fear has not changed. You may have forgotten how you got up and walked when you were a baby. So God constantly reassures you. A lot of things may look daunting, but God wants you to remember what He says to one, He says to many. Yes, our humanities may be limited. We may not see everything. We certainly do not know everything. But God wants us to focus on the things we know. Keep what you have been given. What you know is enough. You know that God loves you. You know that God thinks about you. Jeremiah 29 11 reminds you, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. God says, I have intentionally got thoughts for you. I have a plan for you. I have good plans for you. Good plans only. I have nothing bad planned for you. I am giving your life a favorable and desired outcome. You know that He is God, that His counsel will stand, that it is what He purposes that happens. And just in case you ever wondered if that scripture could ever be for you. So Psalms 3311 comes in and tells you that the counsel of the Lord stands forever, as well as the thoughts of His heart to all generations. And for further emphasis, God tells you in Isaiah 46.10 that He declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, He says, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. This is what Joseph knew when he said, You guys meant really bad things for me, but God meant it for good. Imagine. So, you really have no business allowing fear to terror you, no matter what it is. No matter what it is, you have to know God's got you. Are you relocating? Are you entering an unknown territory? Are circumstances forcing you to do things you thought were beneath you? Are you trying to get new deals for your business? Are you meeting new corporations for contracts? Are you entering a new phase of your life? Because if you are about to do any of this, God knows. And He tells you in Genesis 46.3, Fear not to go down in Egypt, for there I will make you a great nation. Is it a project for you? There is something big you need to execute. Do you have big dreams? Do your dreams scare you? And yet you know you have to embark on them. Are you afraid you will get stuck or be stranded in the middle of nowhere? And in 1 Chronicles 28.20, the Bible says, God will be with you. He will not fail you nor leave you until you have accomplished. Fear wants to hold you down and keep you aground, whereas faith wants to give you wings. Faith will inspire you. Fear will seek to paralyze you. God knows fear will stare at you in the face, sometimes as tall as the Goliath. But you must remember, it is your duty to remember. Recall how the Bible says, forget not all his benefits. Be like David, who knew that the principle to defeating Goliath, the giant who already terrorized tens of thousands of soldiers of the Israelites, was the same principle of how he had defeated the bears and the lions. Remember your previous victories. Are you looking for a new job or afraid you won't get the promotion? You just need to simply remember how you got your first job. Remember how you got your last promotion. Your rest is in actually knowing that God loves you. Manifest God's love. Let the consciousness of being loved by God rest richly in you. You will have noticed that 1 John 4.18 says that there is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Your faith will swell from reminding yourself of these kinds of words often and often. 
For the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I am not sure any one of us has ever had it as rough as Joseph has had it, who already started out life without his mother, having lost his mother when he was very young. Ordinarily, that was tough, but he had the love of his father, the father who made him a coat of many colors. The same coat did remind the brothers that they didn't like Joseph. Imagine how Joseph felt when he was thrown into the pit by his own brothers. Imagine how Joseph must have prayed, God, please spare my life. Do not let me die like this. And then they took the opportunity to sell him as a slave. So Joseph woke up one morning, the beloved son of a rich father, and then by sundown he was already a slave. Is that not what we call a wicked twist in fate? But God knew what his thoughts were for Joseph. Joseph could not have known he will end up becoming the most important person in Egypt. There, you see, is the whole essence of faith. You don't know, you just trust. That's faith. Faith is acting as though you know God is thinking good stuff for you. Faith is behaving like God is for you. Fear and faith are similar in a certain way. They both speak. Faith speaks and fear also speaks, but they use different vocabulary. One exudes assurance and hope while the other reeks of hopelessness and despair. In essence, faith is making sure that the words of your mouth align with the words of God. Not just the general words of God, but even the specific promises of God over the particular issues that you otherwise are prone to worry about. The Bible says that you have the measure of faith. Every believer has the measure of faith. This means you can speak. Jesus said in Mark 11:23, have faith in God, i.e. believe the capacity, intention, and readiness of God over your matter. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4:13, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. So when David saw Goliath, he remembered that God had helped him deal with the bear and the lion. David was not the only Israelite there. Certainly, there were many people, Israelites who God had helped too. But it was only David that remembered. The Bible shows us here that remembering is an effective way to deal with fear. Fear likes to creep up on people. Stop fear dead in its tracks. Remember. Remember the previous similar things that God had done for you. And once you remember, the next step is to say it. David told the story twice. First, when King Saul tried to project his own fear onto David. You see, people will project their own fear onto you. You must not allow such fears to grab a hold of you. Saul said in 1 Samuel 17, you are not able to go out against a Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Did you notice how Saul had at best only one-sided facts? People do that all the time, and most times it is the people closest to us. David had to tell Saul his story. What is your story? And when David proceeded to the face-off with Goliath, he still spoke. When you believe, you speak. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Talk about speaking boldly. Fear will get you thinking about yourself alone, but you must be like Joseph. Even when the continuous turn of events got him to prison, he still loved and served the prison masters and the fellow inmates. Enough to notice if they were sad or moody. Faith serves. Joseph had problems of his own. He should have been afraid for his life. He had not seen his father for many years. He was alone. 
He used to be a loved son, and then he became a slave. And now he was a prisoner for a crime he didn't commit. Joseph embodies faith. When he shared his dreams, he ended up in the prison. As a faithful person, he continues to help other people. He interpreted the dreams of others. Fear wants you to focus on yourself. Faith wants you to focus on God so that you can help people. When David saw Goliath cursing, he was genuinely angry. Why should somebody curse the children of God like this? He must have thought. He wasn't thinking about himself alone. Fear is selfish. Faith is selfless. One gets nothing done. The other gets great things accomplished. Let the excerpt of this psalm always resonate with you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear. Though a host should encamp around me, my heart shall not fear. We go through stuff all the time. Some of them are depressing. Some are unsettling. We faced a host of situations every time. Some can be embarrassing, while some can want to be disheartening. I have these excerpts with you from Psalms 23 and 27, because I want you to choose faith. Many are the times we find ourselves blaming people for the things that happen to us. A day might not pass before you hear someone say, were it not for this person, I would have done this. I would be this. If so-and-so had not done this, then this would not have happened. We blame people because they kept us and made us miss the bus. We blame people because they did not tell us our kids were crossing the road, and so they got hit. We blame people for not reminding us the deadline was due, and so we submitted our assignments past time. We endlessly say if this person had done this, then this would or would not have happened. Now is there any justification in that? The much the Bible says concerning this is telling us to be our brothers and sisters keepers. It does not tell us to rely on others to have our lives orderly. The Bible encourages us to take care of others, but it discourages us from making ourselves other people's responsibility. In Jeremiah 17.5, the Bible says, Cursed is the man who puts their trust in man, who draws strength from mere flesh. Why do you look up to a fellow man to do for you things you should be asking from God? If your trust is in man, the Bible calls you cursed. God is the one we should look up to, because whatever he says and does is not subject to human approval. If you are qualified by God, no man can disqualify you. If you are an appointed of God, no one can disappoint you. God is the only one with the final say over our lives, so it's Him we should seek counsel from. We should ask for advice from the Spirit of God. When we are in a dilemma and we need advice, we should rely on the Spirit of God to help us. Why do you wait for someone to compliment you? Why must you wait and feel for someone to say you are beautiful? In as much time when people say nice things about us, we feel good? That it is not where we should base our self-esteem on. Our focus should be on what God says about us. And He says that He created us in His own image and likeness. God says that you look like Him. He says that you are wonderfully and beautifully made. Quit seeking approval from men. People will disappoint you. They will leave you bitter. They'll make you feel undeserving of anything good in this world. If you listen to the voices of the world, you will find yourself with a lot of unnecessary information. Do not rely on people. Stop depending on friends and family members. Make it a habit to have your ways guided by God. Because only God can never forget, abandon, or forsake us. He says in Isaiah that even though a mother may forget a baby she has born, He will never forget us. Isaiah 49.15 People will love you when there is something in offer for them. They will be willing to help, but in exchange for something from you. Your boss might be willing to give you a promotion, but not before you give him some favors. 
Your lecturer might give you the high scores you crave, but it won't be for nothing. Your deskmate will reserve you a seat at the front row, but in return you will do something else for her. That's how people are. The there are no free things principle is what governs most human relationships. It might not apply to you, but it may apply to the people you interact with. There is real danger in relying on people. It is risky to put your trust in man, who is there today and is gone tomorrow, just like the grass of the field. Isaiah 2.22 says, Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why should you trust in a mere mortal, yet you have the privilege to trust in God, who is eternal? If it is God who establishes the plans of man, wouldn't it be wiser to trust him than to trust in fellow men? Unless the Lord builds the house, the builder labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the guards stand watch in vain. Psalm 127.1 This verse speaks on how useless it is to trust in men. They tell us that God is the only one who is capable of making our plans come to pass. If no man can control even a small percentage of their life, how about being entrusted with the lives of other people? If your trust is in men, you will be disappointed. If all you relay is on a mere mortal like you, you are in for a great shock. People will always be people. They will pretend to love us for the benefit that come with it. Other people will deny you certain opportunities simply because they don't like you. But if you trust in God and ask for anything by faith, then it will be done. God never disappoints. Psalm 37.25 says, I was young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. Even when you're in a bad situation, trust in God. Do not rely on people to help you out. Put your total dependency on God. He will get you out of the situation. Psalm 910 says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. People lie. People betray. People give up. People get tired, people lose interest, but God never does. He has never and he will never. He is not a man that he should lie. God does not betray. He does not tire at helping us out when we cry unto him. He can never lose interest in us. He is always on the lookout for us to ensure we are well. God is always there for us. He is the only one we should depend. Do not depend on anyone to cheer you up. Do not make anyone the source of your happiness. Do not wait for anyone to provide you with all what you need. Trust in God to give you the desires of your heart. Only God cannot take advantage of your needs. It is only God that cannot go spilling your secrets to anyone. It is only God who knows what he has in store for us. Therefore, if we trust in him, we have the assurance that no matter what happens, he always has our back. Psalm 121, 1-2 I lift up my eyes and look onto the mountains. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. So pick yourself up. Your worth is not dependent on what people say or do not say. You're not beautiful because someone said so, but because that is what God says. People might make you feel inferior. You can prove them wrong. People might despise you. You can make yourself feel good about you. People might try to bring you down. You can uplift yourself. You can uplift yourself. You might not be so important to them, but to God you are of great value. People may not cheer you up when you need it the most, but think of God as your biggest cheerleader. When no one seems to notice the efforts you've made, cheer yourself up. 
Tell yourself that you can do all things through Christ. Why? Because the Bible says so. Because you are a child of God. Because you got your help from above. People might not take you to be special to them, but remember that you can make yourself feel special. Because that's how God sees you. He even has your name written on his palm, just to show you how special you are. If you put your trust in man, you will be disappointed. When Jesus was arrested, he lacked even one friend that could stand by him during that period. Out of the twelve that had been with him during his ministry, none was willing. Peter, who had promised to always be with him, denied him in front of everyone. And that's the nature of human beings. To support us when things are going well, and when they're out of control, leaving us to solve them on our own. People will be there for you at first, but with time they get bored and leave. They will not hold your hand from the beginning to the end like God can. They will not supply your needs without problem like God can. Nobody will get you out of trouble countless times like God can. No one will give their lives up for you or that of their dear one for you like God did. Only few people, if any, will help you out of genuine concern. Put your trust in God. Stop relying on mere mortal human beings. Look up on the hills, for that is where your help will come from. If anything that you do, trust in God rather than relying on people. If you want to further your studies, trust in God that he will provide you with fees. If you want to start a business, trust in God that you will get the capital. If you are sick and seeking healing, take medicine and accompany them with prayer because God is your healer. Do not give people too much reverence in your life such that they take the place of God. Remember that they are creation just like yourself. It is the creator, not the creation, who is to be worshipped and trusted. The Bible says that those who put their trust in God shall never be disappointed. They shall stop seeking the validation and approval of men. Believe in whatever God says about you and your life. The praise and honor people give is temporary. Their happiness over your success is short-lived. They're only happy on the outside, but deep inside, they are genuinely happy. They will be happy when things are good, but disappear once we are in need of their help. If Jesus had relied on support from his disciples to make it through what had happened to him, he would have lost it. But since he relied on God, Jesus overcame. It was God that gave him the strength. That is what we should all desire. To call ourselves blessed even when people curse us. To always be happy even when people disappoint us. To say to ourselves, we can do it even when no one believes us. To rely fully on the promises of God. To feed directly of his word. Not to listen to the voices of the world. God wants us to stop relying on people and to trust in him alone. Start today. A. Failure is one thing that is inevitable in life. A popular quote says that if you've never failed, then you've never tried anything new. We actually don't just fail doing new stuff. We can also fail as we do things we've done for years. Think about the perfect driver who knows all the city roads, but one day they miss a sign and cause an accident. That perfect chef that prepares the most delicious meals but one day they get the salt measurement wrong. All I am saying is failure is something we encounter on our day-to-day -day lives. We fail in our relationships with others. We fail in our marriages. We fail in our studies. We fail in keeping the promises we make to our loved ones. 
We fail even the people who believe in us most. We fail in our decision making and that is not just it. We also fail in our relationship with God. Have you ever sat down and thought how badly you've messed up? You're like, this is the worst I could ever do as a believer. You are even ashamed to go before God in prayer and repent. You do not know where to begin. You are at a loss at what to pray for and how to do it. Well, it's not a new thing. The Bible has many accounts of people who failed God, but they still made up and picked themselves up. They regained their balance in walking with Christ. It was one fine evening dining with Christ on his last free night on earth. Jesus and his disciples were having the last supper and out of nowhere, Jesus told them that one of them would betray him. That was something they could not have thought of, especially not when they were comfortably having a feast to mark an important celebration. They began questioning who it was and when Jesus said it was one of them, Peter went ahead to say that he could never do it. He swore to Jesus that he would never betray him and that he would be with him wherever he went. Jesus replied that that night, before the cock crowed, Peter would deny him three times. And on the same night, Jesus got arrested and on questioning Peter denied knowing him or being his follower for three times, just as Jesus had prophesied. Immediately, the cock crowed. Jesus looked at Peter and when Peter saw him, he realized what he had done. He remembered the prophecy Jesus had made at the dinner table and realized that he had broken the vow. He went out and cried bitterly. Peter failed. He broke the vow he had made to Jesus. But that did not stop him from continuing with the mission of Christ with so much zeal. That did not make him any less of an apostle. Once he realized what he had done, he showed remorse for this action and got up on his feet again to fight for his faith. And just like Peter, sometimes we make genuine promises. We give our honest views about something. We commit ourselves to the Christian course with the honest belief that things will be as we have planned them. Sometimes we fail and it is not intentional. Just like Peter, we mean it when we say, Lord, I accept you today. I promise to leave my old life and start afresh in you. But some moments later, we find ourselves having done what we promised God we wouldn't do. In such a situation, one might feel very low, but we should not give up. There is always a second and third and infinite number of chances to make it up to God. We should not give up in the strive to live lives worth of the calling of Christ just because we have missed once. It is not just in the New Testament where believers made mistakes in their lives. David was a king in Israel. The Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart. Was David perfect? No. Did he fail God at some point? Yes. But failure did not stop him from putting the interest of God at heart. He still pursued the knowledge of God and sought to please him. Despite the fact that he had committed adultery and organized the killing of an innocent man at some point in his life, he did not let his failure weigh him down. He used it as an opportunity to draw closer to God and repent and make stronger his relationship with him. When you think you have screwed up real bad, do not give up on your faith. Do not say to yourself, this salvation thing is hard. I don't think I can do it. Instead, use it as an opportunity to build yourself in faith. Don't let failure stop you from pleasing God. Sometimes it's the devil who uses failure to make us lose our stand in salvation. Strengthen yourself like David. Say to yourself each time you feel like giving up, I've got a thing going and I'm not letting it go. Do not give up on salvation just because you messed up one time. God is faithful enough to take you through all that you are facing. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, Be confident in this that he who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. The time we realize we have made a mistake 
We should not shy away from him. We should go to him and with our hearts as broken as they are and be honest with him as we present our case before him. Failure is not the end. It is just the closure of one phase and the start of another, a more glorious one. When Hagar got a baby by Abraham, she got full of herself. She started despising Hannah. She passed on that attitude to her son, Ishmael. Ishmael adapted it and grew up disrespecting his brother Isaac. Now when Sarah had had enough of her, she had them chased away into the desert. Now Hagar was at one point eating life from a silver spoon. She had a son who had a chance to become Abraham's heir. She had everything she could have needed. She became proud and that marked the beginning of her fall up to the point that Abraham chased her and her son into the desert. The desert is a very dry place. Hagar and Ishmael got very thirsty and tired. They were staring at death for there seemed no source of water nearby. But God did not see Hagar as a woman who had messed up her life. When God looked down at Hagar in the desert, he did not see her as someone going through what she had deserved for despising Sarah. She saw a mother of generations. He looked at her with compassionate eyes. He caused her to see a well from where she drew water and saved her life and that of her son. When we think we have failed so hard that God has no more chance for us, that is the time God wants us most. He picks us up and remolds us. He gives us the water that we need to keep going. When our situations have turned upside down and we cannot understand what's going on anymore, God comes and whispers to us, It's alright child, I got this under control. We may fail God, but He will never fail us. We might wander away from Him into useless wastelands, but He will wait for us to return. Our relationship with Him is explained in the parable of the prodigal son. The son thought he had made it in life when he reached an age where he could inherit his share of his father's wealth. His father, as loving as he was, gave him the share. The son went out to a faraway land where he squandered the inheritance on women and luxurious lifestyle. When it was finished, he survived on feeding pigs and feeding on their food too, until one day he remembered of how the servants in his father's house had more than enough to eat. He thought, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. The Bible records what happened once the son returned to his father's house. The father forgave him and welcomed him home. He had him clothed in decent clothes and threw a party for him. That is how God waits upon us to go back to him. Once we have realized our mistake, his hands are always open, ready to receive us. He is a loving father who can never give up on his children. All he wants us to do is repent and go back to him, and he will receive us warmly into his embrace. Failure is in all aspects of life, but it is not the end of everything. Whatever thing you have been trying to do with little success, do not give up. Our lives are filled with problems and troubles. The hatred of the world is disheartening. Sometimes you may be mocked and despised for standing strong for the kingdom. You are abused and called all sorts of names because you believe in Jesus Christ. You feel like giving up. You are tired. It is not abnormal. Even a great prophet like Elijah had his low moment when he felt like giving up. He said, Lord, this is enough. Just take me to glory, I'm ready to give up. He felt desperate and worn out. He also felt all alone, for he thought he was the only one still standing for God. He was ready to give up. Even Jeremiah felt the same way. His isolated life had become too much to bear. He told God, Lord, I think I'll quit the ministry and get a little motel by the roadside and rest. He felt like giving up, but these two great men of God did not give up. Like David, they held on to the thing God had begun inside them. Sometimes we are put into tests through failure. We begin a business and it does not pick up. God wants us to see whether we will still praise Him. 
We work hard for something and it does not come out as planned. That might be a test God is putting us through. He wants to see whether we still trust in Him. He wants to see whether we still believe in His power. God promised Abraham and Sarah a son when they were 75 and 65 years of age respectively. Yet, they had to wait for 25 years before the child was born. They kept on trying. Sarah's failure to conceive during those trial years did not make them doubt the promise of God. They still held on to what God had said. If God called you to be a preacher among nations, no matter how many times you try and fail, do not give up. If God showed you through a vision that one day you will be working for a big organization, no matter how many times you fail the interview, do not give up. Failure is just a part of the journey. It is neither the destination nor is it the end. Pick yourself once more and give it one more try. This time round, start on a high note of faith. This time round, stand on what God said. Failure might be inevitable, but quitting is never an option. Do not give up. Keep trying.